So, uh, okay, here we go. So, so today I'm going to tell you about the, this potential connection between uh, the DNA damage response and innate immunity. Uh, of course, you know that DNA damage protects the integrity of the genome, and there is also this second pathway uh, called the innate immune response that, that protects cells from being invaded by uh, DNA of foreign origin, like non-self DNA, like viruses. And usually we tend to consider that these two pathways are independent, are not connected, mostly because we never read the virology papers. Uh, but if we do, uh, we, we find that actually there are lots of connections. And uh, if you look at, um, so we know now uh, that uh, during the DNA repair process, there is DNA that is soluble DNA fragments that are generated, and that can diffuse into the cytosol and be detected by the sensors of uh, viral DNA as, uh, as non-self, and, and this would induce uh, inflammatory response. And if you look at the factors that are involved in the sensing of DNA species in the cytosol, uh, you find all these uh, very familiar factors, uh, including uh, RPA and RAS51, which were shown very rec recently to be involved in the, in the sequestration of these uh, DNA uh, fragments into the cytosol, into the, the nucleus, sorry. So today I'm going to tell you about a, a, a protein called SAMHG1 that is encoded by the, the human genome that is expressed in most of the cells uh, and that was uh, first characterized as a factor involved in the resection, in the, in the protection uh, of, uh, against uh, HIV virus infection. And uh, we got interested into this protein because the, 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 it has a DNTPase activity, and this DNTPase activity was characterized by the, the lab next door to ours. And so this protein has an HG domain that contains the first characterized uh, DNTP hydrolase activity. It has also a, a putative uh, five, a three prime to five prime exonuclease activity, although this is uh, currently very debated uh, in the, in the SAMHG1 field. And uh, um, what is also very interesting about this protein is that it's frequently mutated in the Cardi Gutierrez syndrome, uh, which is a very severe congenital en en uh, encephalopathy that is caused by a, a chronic induction of type 1 interferon. And on top of that, SAMH1 is frequently mutated in cancers, and it was shown in CLL that the mutation of SAMH1 can be the, the uh, founding event uh, leading to cancer development. So uh, we, we first started uh, working on this protein because of its DNTPase activity, obviously because DNTPs are very important for DNA replication, but, but uh, we found eventually that it's doing much more than regulating DNTPs. So uh, we first looked at, at the localization, and we found that SAMHG1 uh, co-localizes with EDU incorporation for SI, so suggesting that it might be uh, doing something with DNA replication forks. So then we depleted the protein uh, and uh, we measured the S phase progression by doing a pulse of EDU and the chase. And what we found is that in control cells, uh, uh, there is a rapid progression for S phase and after four hours, we can see that uh, S phase cells go back to G1. But in the absence of some AG1, uh, you see that it's not the case. So it's indicating that uh, the, the cells are, are progressing more slowly for S phase. We also looked at the replication timing in the cells, and we found that about, for about 10% of the genome, uh, the SAMHG1 depleted cells show here in green show a, a premature activation of late replicating domains. So we, we still don't know the reason for that, but clearly there is a massive perturbation of the replication program when uh, SAMHG1 is not there. So then we looked directly at the progression of replication forks using the DNA fiber assay you've heard many times about already. And so uh, what we did was to pulse uh, uh, cells with IDU and then CLDU. We measured the length of the CLDU tracks as an indication of the distance covered by the forks. And we found that in the absence of some AG1, the, 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 this distance was actually much, much shorter. So indicating that some AG1 uh, is uh, required for normal fork progression. Uh, we also looked an assay where we looked at the, the distance covered by sister replication forks as an indication of uh, replication fork uh, stalling, spontaneous replication fork stalling. And, and we found that uh, uh, 
the, the, the fraction of folks, of sister folks that show more than a 60% difference was actually increased in some HG1 depleted cells. So indicating that not only the folks are slower, but also uh, they, they pose or they stall more frequently in normal growth conditions. So uh, now, what is the mechanism? What, how how SAMHG1 is regulating fault progression? So we know that, I told you already that, and that's really clear that it's degrading the NTP pools in non-cycling cells, but also it's regulating the balance between the pools. So it could be that uh, in absence of some HG1, the fork the, the progression is, is affected because of the imbalance between the NTP pools. Uh, so we try to address this possibility. Uh, there are mutations that were uh, done to measure in vitro the separation between the nuclease and the, and the DNTPase activities, but this is not extremely convincing and it's very, again, very debated in the field. So uh, what makes a consensus probably is the fact that some HG1 is phosphorylated by cyclin ACDK2 on this rayon in here, the C-terminus, and uh, it was shown that uh, uh, some HG1 is active as a DNTPase in non-cycling cells when it's, not when it's not phosphorylated. So it's, when it's unphosphorylated, it's forming this tetramer, and upon phosphorylation by cyclin ACDK2, the tetramer dissociates and the DNTPase activity is lost. But this, at least in vitro, retains some nuclease activity. So what we did was to first check that indeed some HG1 is phosphorylated as these cells enter into S phase on this residue. And then we uh, depleted again some HG1. So you see again that the folks are slower in the absence of some HG1. We complemented with a full end protein and we rescued completely the normal fork progression. And we complemented either with a, a phosphomimetic mutation uh, on this residue or uh, a non phosphorylatable version. And you can see that only the phosphomimetic version rescues the normal fork progression and not this one, which is supposed to be uh, the NTPAs uh, active, and this one is not supposed to be the NTPAs active. So this clearly shows that the, 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 the function that promotes normal fork progression depends on phosphorylation by cyclin ACDK2 and is independent on the DNTP uh, regulation function. So what could uh, some HG1 do at the forks? So you've heard many times about this uh, uh, idea that uh, MR11 is recruited to pause replication fork, degrades uh, nascent DNA, and this degradation is actually prevented by BRCA2 and, and RAT51. So we asked whether uh, some HG1 could be involved in this process. So the, the way we did the experiments was to uh, release cells into hydroxyria. So we first did a label with IDU in the absence of the drug, then added hydroxyria for an increasing period of time, and we measured the length of both the CLDU and the IDU track. So if you look at the CLDU track, you see that, as I told you before, that uh, in the absence, in, the, in, in control cells, uh, when we add HU, we have a, a very sh a sharp reduction of fork speed, as expected, and then uh, the fork keeps moving at a very slow pace. And now in some HG1 cells, again, the fork is slower to start with, but you can see that in the presence of hydroxyurea, it's actually moving faster than the, the control cells. And now if we look specifically at the IDU uh, label, so the track that was labeled before the addition of the drug, you see that uh, this IDU track in control cells is getting uh, gradually shorter over time, whereas it's, it remains the same in, in some HG1 depleted cells. So, we interpret this data in, in, uh, as this depicted here. So then, so we label ongoing replication, then we add the drug. So what we, we, we propose is that in the absence, in the, in the presence of hydroxyria, there are NICs that are created uh, on newly replicated DNA, probably uh, due to uh, MR11 activity as proposed by uh, Vincenzo Costanzo. And, and probably that these NICs are enlarged uh, by some nuclease activity involving some HD1, uh, uh, whereas the fork keeps moving. Okay, so and then the, these these uh, red tracks are progressively replaced by by green tracks as the fork moves. So in the absence of some HD1, you have no degradation, no slowdown of the fork, and and the fork actually uh, seem to move faster. 
and we tested whether this, this function, this degradation of the IDU track was dependent on the phosphorylation. And so you see that uh, in some AGO antiplated cells, this, this track is protected, so it's, it's actually much longer. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, it's degraded if we complement with the phosphoritable, the phosphomimetic mutation, but it's, it's not uh, degraded in, in the absence of phosphorylation of some HG1. So it looks like the phosphorylation of some HG1 by cyclin A is promoting uh, the degradation of uh, H2 arrested folks. Uh, so, uh, I don't have time to show you the data, but if we deplete rat 51 we have an extent, uh, extensive uh, degradation of the fork. If we deplete MR11, together with some AG1, we see no difference, uh, so suggesting that these two proteins are epistatic. So then we asked uh, what, what could be the function of degrading the fork uh, with some AG1. And uh, you've heard that, uh, of course, it's important to activate the ATR check one uh, pathway, that this activation depends on the presence of RPA code to the uh, SSDNA. So if some AG1 is involved in, in the, uh, the, the generation of single-stranded DNA behind the fork, then it might be important to activate the ATR check one pathway. So we first looked at the, the, the production of uh, single-stranded DNA at HU arrested forks. Uh, by uh, first labeling the cells with BRU, then detecting uh, uh, BRU without denaturation after uh, HU exposure uh, in control cells and in some HG1 depleted cells. And we found that there was a reduction not only in the number of BRU positive cells, but also in the intensity of, uh, and the number of foci uh, per, uh, per nuclei. And maybe you can notice here that we detected also BRDU-labeled DNA in the cytosol of some AG1 depleted cells, and I, I will come back to, to that uh, later on. So uh, we also looked at the, the, the presence of RPA induced by uh, HU, and again, uh, in some AG1 depleted cells, we saw reduction of uh, RPA uh, um, coated sing single-stranded DNA uh, after HU exposure. And uh, concomitant to that, we measured that there is a reduction of phospho check one uh, activation, uh, both in the presence of HU or CPT when some HG1 is depleted. There is also a reduction of gamma H2X, but not of check two, suggesting that it's really the ATR pathway that is affected when some HG1 is not there. And finally, we measured the, 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 the fork restart. Uh, after CPT treatment, so we measure the fraction of cells that can reactivate uh, CPT arrested forks after wash, and we found that in conditions where 50% of the fork restart within 30 minutes after removal of the drug, uh, there is a, a, a strong reduction of fork restart in the absence of some AG1, and this is epistatic to MR11 because if we deplete if we inactivate uh, MR11 with mirin, we have no additive effect of the, the depletion of the two activities. So uh, wh what I've shown you so far is that uh, some AG1 is important uh, for the, the, the processing of arrested replication fork, and this is important for the restart of arrested forks and also for the signaling of uh, arrested forks through the, the ATR check one uh, uh, pathway. So now, how about the Icardi Gutierrez syndrome? I told you that the Icardi Gutierrez syndrome is, is characterized with the accumulation of uh, uh, type 1 interferon in the cells. So, how could be this phenotype be related to uh, interferon? So, what we did first was to test, uh, uh, to analyze replication uh, in, uh, in B cells from an AGS5 patient with a mutation in some HD1 that does not affect the DNTP uh, activity. And, and we found that very much like in our cell line models, uh, there is a slower fork progression and, and, and uh, a decreased processing of arrested forks in the cells from this patient. Of course, it doesn't tell us the link to, to, to interferon, so we decided to look at that directly. So the model would be that uh, when some AG1 is not there, for some reason, there is an aberrant processing of the fork, there is release of single-stranded DNA in the cytosol, and this would be sensed by sensors of the innate immune system, and this would induce a type 1 interferon response and the inflammation. And so we decided to look directly whether we could detect single-stranded DNA in the cytosol. Uh, actually, this was shown to be the case uh, uh, 
in, in, a, in a paper from the, the lab of David Barnes, where she, and she showed that in the absence of TREX1, which is another nuclease that is present in the cytosol and degrades uh, uh, DNA species, uh, if you detect single strand of DNA in these cells, uh, using an antibody against single stranded DNA, you can find that there is a, a very strong increase of this single stranded DNA in the absence of TREX1. So we asked whether it's the same with some age one depleted cells. So in untreated cells, you see that there is a little bit more, but nothing compared to TREX1 depleted cells. And now if you treat cells with hydroxyria, then you see this DNA appearing in control cells and to a much larger extent in some age one depleted cells. So then we asked whether this DNA is, acting, is activating the type 1 interferon response, and, and indeed it's a, it's a case. So here, it's by looking at the MRI level of a different interferon gene, we see that it's largely increased compared to uh, control cells. And if we add alloxyria, this increase is, is, is even larger. So you see that uh, within two hours, there is a huge induction of type 1 uh, interferon genes in the absence of some HD1. And if we label uh, ongoing replication at FOX just before adding uh, HU with BRU, and then we look at cytosolic DNA two hours later, we found that this cytosolic DNA in some HD1 depleted cells is actually labeled with BRU, so indicating that indeed this DNA is directly coming from the stored replication FOX. So finally, we asked whether, uh, you know, how this DNA could be generated when some HD1 is not there. So we reason that if it's displaced from the fork, there might be some helicase involved. And, and we thought that an obvious uh, uh, candidate for being this helicase is RACU1 because it's, we know it's acting uh, at arrested replication forks. So what we did was to deplete RACU1 and then see whether we would suppress this cytosolic DNA. And indeed, it's the case. So here you have the same HG1 uh, depleted cells. If we treat these cells with uh, uh, sRNA against RACU1, then you see that we largely reduce the amount of uh, cytosolic DNA in these cells. And uh, there is no effect of RACU1 alone by itself. Now, if we look at the interferon response, uh, in light gray, it's the, the uh, same HD1 uh, situation. And in dark gray here is the, the double. So you see that clearly uh, there is a reduction on the, uh, of the induction of interferon genes uh, when uh, RACU1 is co-depleted with, with some HD1. So that would be uh, the, the, the model. So what we propose is that uh, some HD1 has, has a dual role in, in the cell. So in non-cycling cells, it's forming this tetramer. It's acting as a DNTPase, and it's very important as, as a uh, restriction factor for viruses and, and also for the, the maintenance of a balanced pool in these cells. But then the cells go into S, uh, this uh, tetramer gets phosphorylated, it disassembles, and then some HD1 is, is released, and now it's acting, uh, it can be active as, as a nuclease, uh, or at least as a partner for uh, some still unknown nuclease in the processing of stored replication fork. And this is important to activate the ATR checkpoint uh, and to uh, re recover from uh, replication stress. Now, when some AG1 is not there, the, the fork will be incorrectly processed by RACU1, and this would lead to the production of uh, cytosolic DNA species that are sensed by the innate immune system and induce the type 1 interferon response. So in, in, in AGS patients, what we can think is that there is this uh, low level of chronic replication stress that leads to the accumulation of these species and lead to this chronic uh, inflammation. And this is important also in terms of uh, cancer treatment because if we could manipulate this response to uh, chemotherapeutic agents, for instance, uh, by forcing the cells to produce more of this uh, uh, DNA, uh, then uh, we could force or favor the rejection of cancer cells by the innate immune response because we know that the type 1 interferon response is linked to uh, the production of uh, ligands at the cell surface that are detected by uh, NK cells, for instance. So maybe that's a, a strategy for the future. So finally, to thank the people who did the work, uh, the, it was mostly done by Yali Lin, who is in the audience, with the help of two PhD students, uh, 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 Flavie Coquel and, and Maria Silva. 
Uh, and so it's also a collaboration with myself and Kiran uh, at IGH. Uh, I didn't have time to show the data, but Bernard Lopez uh, uh, helped us to, to look at uh, the repair of double strand breaks, and we found that uh, some SG1 is also required for at least for a single strand annealing uh, at double strand breaks. And uh, we also think uh, Jean Charles Cadore helped us with uh, the replication timing studies. Um, yeah, so we're still looking for evidence that some SG1 is directly acting as a nuclease, so that's the best evidence we have so far, but we're still uh, searching. And finally, I will use my last 15 seconds to advertise a, a meeting that we are organizing with Andres Aguilera in November on the conflict between replication and transcription. So this will be in, in Brittany, in France. And we have a great line of speakers, and so if you are interested, I encourage you to go and look for more details on, on this website. And I'll take questions. Thank you.